Uh, eBuyLine is an online platform that lets publishers manage their freelance journalists and a place for freelancers to market themselves to and develop relationships with editors from around the country. We are currently used by the newsrooms of a growing and diverse group of newspapers, blogs, and companies who use eBuyLine to assign stories, find new freelancers, and handle payments quickly and easily. Um, I am part of a team that's working very hard to make sure that the editorial process remains an essential part of what eBuyLine does. Uh, we are in the business of linking freelance journalists and professional writers with editors and publishers around the country. And uh, we want to make sure that our members, that's uh, many of you, uh, are getting the most out of it. Um, with that, uh, we're going to get started in a second. We are going to take uh, questions towards the end of this. Uh, if you want to ask a question, feel free to type it into the chat or the question section of the GoTo uh, webinar panel that you see, and we'll get to them uh, as time allows. You can also send us questions at freelancer at ebyline.com. Um, you can email us at freelancer at ebyline.com, and again, we'll do our best to get to all of them, and, and maybe if we don't have time and we do have a lot of questions, uh, we might take some of those offline and send uh, responses out. We're also going to be recording today so that uh, if you want to watch this later on or send it to a friend, we hope to have it up on our site pretty soon. So with that, uh, I want to introduce our special guest, and that is Michelle Goodman. Uh, hi, Michelle. Hi. Good to be here. Uh, Michelle uh, has been a freelance journalist since 1992. She's the author of two books, My So-Called Freelance Life and The Anti-9 to 5 Guide. She's also been a columnist for abcnews.com and Entrepreneur. Uh, her writing has appeared online or in print in the New York Times, CNN, Salon, AOL, Yahoo, and American Express, as well as many, many others. And she lives in Seattle, so we are doing a cross a transcontinental uh, webinar today. I am Peter Beller. I'm eBuyLine's Director of Content. Uh, I myself was a freelancer. Uh, it was a while ago, though, so uh, Michelle is here to be the current expert on how to handle editor relationships. So with that, uh, we've worked based on based on Michelle's writing and her website which is excellent as well um, we did come up with a, a couple of key concepts that Michelle wanted to discuss today um, maybe we call these uh, pillars uh, to building editor relationships and we're going to run through these in a second uh, gaining trust asking the right questions uh, curveballs that get thrown at you uh, such as revisions extra interviews and staying on editors radar which uh, was always for me the toughest one um, before we dig into that, I wanted to ask you, Michelle, what's your definition of a healthy editor-freelancer uh, relationship? Um, well, from the freelancer's point of view, I would say the, the ideal editor is someone that um, gives you ample time to write a story, none of this um, you know, contacting you on Thursday afternoon and they need a 2,000-word feature by Monday morning. I mean, some people are willing to do that, but um, you know, at some point you get to the point where you like to have a life and your weekends off and so you know an editor who's organized enough to give you enough lead time um, a public and they're they're clear in their directions and um, you know they're not changing their mind about story focus once you turn the story in um, they turn you know they read they read the article you submit relatively quick quickly and get back to you with questions and revisions needed, you know, relatively quickly. Um, and I guess by relatively quickly, I mean, you know, within a couple of weeks or a month, none of this sitting on it for six months business. I know, you know, when you're dealing with some of the largest publications out there, like the Atlantic or something, you hear stories of people waiting months and months to get feedback. Um, and, you know, sometimes you do those things for the very big publications. Um, but you know, in my in my ideal world, um, you know, I like working with people that everything's a little more quickly, and I you know I get paid within um, a month or so of acceptance. So uh, just somebody who's a little bit more um, organized and respectful of your time, and um, and you know, just as an editor would expect you to be free of drama and um, as professional as possible, you would hope that they're going to be the same way. You know, one, one thing that you um, left out of all these factors, which I think is interesting, is um, is money. I mean, obviously you said you want to get paid on time, but uh, one thing oh, you yeah. didn't mention is getting paid a lot of money, and I'm curious if you think of your best editor relationships 
um, as, as somewhat independent of how much money you're making from that relationship, uh, whether or not it's really a central thing or a, a good working relationship is really more about personality, less about uh, sort of how much profit you're getting from it. Well, I do, I do think, I guess I tie that more to the publication, and if they're not gonna, going to pay you know, my minimum, I'm probably just not going to work with them, and that's not necessarily the editor's fault. They're working within the um, confines of the budget they're given. But here's kind of an example of related to that. Um, I, I do have an editor um, in a very sort of like high-profile publication um, that I occasionally write for, and I've written for for several years, and um, I've been trying to get more money out of them because it's lower than all my other publications I write for and I'm weighing whether or not I'm still going to work with them and I just keep getting like kind of really blown off when I ask for more money and the same standard answer that I've gotten for years oh we don't pay we don't really pay anyone you're the only one we pay and and um you know I just don't I, and they're very nice and they're nice when I go and meet them and I know their hands are tied by budget, but I just sort of feel, I don't know, there's just, there's something missing there. And so, yes, money definitely plays into it. Well, just, maybe just like it does in, in any job that you have, you can be uh, happy in the job and happy uh, with the people you work with in the office environment. But if you, if you feel like you're sort of dramatically undervalued, um, it's going to, it's going to be felt one way or another. Absolutely. I mean, money is a huge part of it. I mean, it's a huge driving factor in why, you know, most freelancers take the jobs they take. And it's very easy to feel undervalued if um, the pay isn't up to snuff and, and isn't, you know, isn't equivalent with the going rate you're getting paid in other places or competitive with, you know, what their competitors are paying. And then if you factor in, you know, because some, some public, all publications have their quirks. I mean, just as all freelancers have their quirks, so you might always you might have an editor that is slow to send contracts or always says, "Well, just make it fifteen hundred to two thousand words, and it's you know it's kind of okay, whatever the word count is or or just you know something maybe they're not clear, and then if you just or maybe it's something even more negative, and then if you're if compounded by a rate that's slightly lower than your other rates, you know, you're you're not going to consider that maybe one of your A plus editors or publications. It might be like a B or a C mm -hmm. or worse. One one other question before we get to um, sort of the the key concepts around building relationships. You've mentioned on your website and elsewhere in your writing that um, the the digital landscape has really altered the freelance landscape. Um, publications are favoring shorter assignments, less pay, uh, more legwork sometimes. Uh, shorter turnaround times, and I wonder if the focus of the relationships between editors and freelancers uh, is changing as well. It, uh, at least, I think in the past, it's been trying to go steady with a few editors and, and develop a long-term relationship that's that's you know where you can ask for more money or ask for bigger assignments. Um, do you think it's still about that, or are there a lot of flings with online publications, with legacy publications? I, I think it's still about relationships, absolutely. I mean, it's it's fine if you want to be someone that's doing all these, you know, so as you said, one night stands with various online publications, but um, you're going to you're going to do a lot more for your career if you're um, working, you know, if you're working towards building uh, good working relationships with less people as opposed to, you know, always writing for dozens and dozens of publications and you know having to reinvent their relationship wheel each time and also having to do that new negotiation and maybe the new contract and only a little administrative work that goes with it and maybe you know you have to do a little bit of digging around to get into the publication you have to pitch the publication you have to make sure you're writing to their formula so I mean whereas that's not to say don't strive I mean we always strive for higher and higher publications but I still think relationships are important and editors still need they they need good writers and they're looking for relationships and when they find someone that they are very happy with, they don't want to let them go. So yeah, and just to clarify, I mean, what we were talking about with shorter and shorter assignments and less pay, um, you know, while you can't, you know, there's no denying that print publications are shrinking and, you know, we've certainly all seen what's happened with newspapers, there still are, um, you know, feature spots in magazines and and essay spots and, you know, long form journalism spots. It's just the web is just these short, you know, under a thousand word 
blips or blogs and so just and do you, to clarify yeah and do you i mean do you you see sort of a healthy mix in your own uh writing between the online i don't think there's any doubt that online is is sort of permanently going to be a shorter um a shorter assignment shorter articles a different kind of article uh than print but print is still around i mean that's who e byline works with primarily is mm -hmm. newspapers uh and they're still around and they have lots of people and they're producing lots of stories but it's it's yeah it's it's different and, and the world does seem to be going more towards the blog post um the facebook post the tweet um do you, do you think that you need a healthy mix of those well i think um unless you are absolutely opposed to, you know, unless you really don't like print or you don't, really don't like web, but I think it's important to, you know, keep a toe in whatever the newest format is so that you, you know, you, you're marketable and you, and you can get, you have additional options for work. So yeah, I mean, I do a mix of print and online, but um, I still really enjoy print and I, and I did realize about myself recently that I'm not really enjoying, um, writing having this is just me but I had a, a blog that I was doing regularly for the Seattle Times and it was also reprinted like parts of it were reprinted as a Sunday column and I just felt the several time a week commitment um, it, it just wasn't what how I wanted to work I mean I wanted I, I wanted to do um, less pieces a month longer pieces um, and you know just have less projects going at once so you know I think personal preference can play a part in it, but I think it's also just good to have those skills, you know, because you never know when some really interesting job is going to come along. And if you're someone who's familiar with SEO and, you know, plugging your story into a content management tool, and that's what the job happens to be, you have that advantage over someone who is not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to turn to uh, building an editor's trust, that's uh, obviously a good first step to building a relationship. <laughs> um, we put down a couple of, of bullets uh, together, and I was hoping you'd uh, just sort of walk us through these and, and tell us which uh, are maybe the most important to you or have been the most important to you and, and how you'd go about uh, executing a few of these. Okay. Um, well, you know, be introducing yourself to an editor you'd like to work with by saying, um, you know, Peter refer Peter suggested I get in touch with you, or Peter referred me to you, and you know, using or using the full name Peter Beller is probably going to get you a lot further in someone's inbox because um, than just pitching them cold. So if you have a contact, definitely use it because then the editor is obviously seeing oh they're referred by a, a mutual colleague, and you know they'll probably answer that email more quickly than the hundred other ones in their inbox. So it might get your letter of introduction or pitch read more quickly. So I would absolutely um, go that route. Um, you know, freelancers often go so far as to ask, hey, I'm interested in pitching, for example, more magazine. Does anyone work with an editor there? What are they like? And, and then, you know, you're having a private conversation with someone about this on email, and would you mind if I use their name when I contact them with my pitch? Um, Starting the relationship on the right foot, I mean, again, this is just about being as easy to work with as possible. So, you know, if they're asking you questions, get back to them. I try to get back within half a day if it's someone I'm working on a story with or someone I'm trying to get a story going with. Um, you know, if I'm, at, if I'm traveling and, you know, I, we all always have our phones, so I might just tap something and say, you know, I'm, I'm in the airport right now and, yes to that question and I can send you a more detailed response in like three hours or something like that or call um, so so staying in touch and responding yes and um, and I may just jump ahead well no I won't jump I won't go out of order um, showing samples of your best work um, well obviously you just want to, you know this is going back to when you're introducing yourself to an editor or they're asking you um, they've come to you and said, hey, do you have anything? I'm looking for writers. Would you be interested? You obviously want to send clips that are relevant. So if they're well, can, I, can I just jump in really quickly? I know yes, that's, that, seems like, that seems like an obvious one, show samples of your best work, but I remember when I, was, um, when I was just getting started in freelancing, running into this problem, and I've actually seen it on eByline members' profiles. Um, there's your absolute best work that you've ever done, 
then there's the best work that you've done in the last six months, then there's the best work that you've done in the particular category that you're that you're pitching right now. So I remember I was pitching an arts editor at the New York Times. I hadn't covered the arts. Um, I had been covering sort of local news, metro kind of stuff and features. And uh, that sort of tripped me up. Um, do I show her the best writing that I've done uh, at this newspaper? Mm -hmm. uh, do I show her the best writing that I've ever done? Or do I show her what I think she wants to see? Here's what I would do. I mean, and that's sometimes you have to do a combination because I know that problem can come up. So, okay, so say you're pitching the New York Times arts editor. So you want to show a recent national clip. Um, and you do want to show an arts clip, even if it's older. Um, so I would do a combination, you know, two or three that are a combination of those things. Just as long as you're showing, um, you know, the national clip you show, whether it's maybe it's like the Chicago newspaper or something, or you know, San Francisco Chronicle, or just you know, some, or maybe it's a large national magazine, something within hopefully the past year or two, and hopefully it's on. Maybe it's not on the arts, but maybe it's on a lifestyle topic, or maybe it's a feature story, or just something that would show that you could tackle the same kind of topic and in the same kind of tone and writing. Um, if you're going to send a story on economics to the arts editor, that's probably going to be a really big miss. You need to, you should have something a little closer. Um, but in just and if you don't have any exact recent arts clips, but you had some a few years ago. I might send one of those too, unless it was in like you know your college newspaper. Just it should be relatively big, you know, like a regional magazine at least. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. What about the what about the last bullet on this list? Following directions to the letter. I know this is another thing that trips people up because they uh, yeah. maybe they maybe get some a somewhat of a vague assignment uh, or you know pitch me an idea and they, and you know they they think that they've come to agreement but they sort of run with the idea and take it in a new direction. Yeah, this is a really, that's a really great question. I would never run with the idea and take it in a new direction without consulting the editor. And I wouldn't, you know, suggest taking it in a completely new direction unless the story you and the editor agreed upon is not really working out in, is not really playing, the thesis isn't really playing out the one that you and the editor thought was going, that you had agreed to. So you might say, you know, I, I know we were going to research stories on, I need to make up a topic on the spot. <laughs> I know we were going to research stories on pop-up businesses, pop-up restaurants in San Francisco in this particular neighborhood and how they're all the rage. Um, but actually, there's been a little crash in that, you know, this is a bad example, but, um, you know, because you, hopefully you would be more on top of this subject matter before you took a story on it. But, you know, there's been a little crash in this in this little, m you know, mini business trend in in the city, and um, there's actually an interesting new twist. So I think you know we need to cover this. Um, so you'd want to let your editor know if a story is panning out a little differently than expected as soon as possible. Um, they you don't want to deliver a surprise on the due date or right before the due date or after the due date, and um, you know detail it in email or get them on the phone if there's somebody who is okay with phone. And 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 um, definitely don't just say I know this was um do and I've seen people do this you know I know I was assigned to report a thousand word feature on this trend but I'm just gonna write I'm just gonna write it as a first person essay because I think that's the best way to tell it you know that's but people do that so you know you need to follow the the formula and the assignment that was presented. And, and, and the part of the relationship we're talking about right now is building trust so you are setting expectations yeah. and letting the editor know that. Um, they can they can really trust you to take the conversation at face value and, and really deliver what you said you would deliver. And if you can't deliver it, to let them know as soon as possible. Um, right. Which, and I, which I, and I have appreciate. a suggestion too. Um, if you know you get the assignment and it's a little unclear, um, you know I would always clarify. So just to, just to make sure I understand correctly, you're saying X, Y, and Z. And then they'll confirm. Or you know, you may, if it's a new editor or the assignment's a little um, vague, or just you know, you and the editor aren't sure how the research is going to go after you've gotten a little bit into the research, which you hopefully are going to do as soon as possible. If it's you know the the you're unsure how the thing is going to play out, you could just send them a little you know a little skeleton, even just like a paragraph, like here's what I've learned. You know, this is how I'm thinking of structuring the story. Is you know, just want to make sure that we're on the same page. And I actually have. Some editors, um, 
with a larger, I don't know, there's an editor I work with, well, I work with a business publication and they're kind of in, in trend feature stories, they're kind of big into saying, why don't you get in touch um, when you're, you know, like halfway between now and the deadline and just, you know, run your research by us and just, because we'd like to know how it's panning out and what the story, how the story's shaping up. So that's my little opportunity to send them my little mini outline. Okay, like here are the, here are the things I've learned, here are the points I'm going to make. Does that sound good? Is anything missing? Is this not what you wanted? Is this what you wanted? And that kind of thing. And, get, and getting information from editors is actually, that brings us to our, to our next point, which is asking the right questions and making sure that you are getting the information that you need so that both parties are pleased. And some of, some of the points on this slide um, are less about journalism. Well, they're, they're about journalism, but they're also about um, doing sort of marketing work or PR work or, uh, you know, sort of some of the more corporate, yeah, copywriting, some of the more corporate jobs that uh, a lot of freelance writers do to make ends meet. Um, so if you had one or two tips on just getting the right information to make an assignment go smoothly, uh, where would you start? Yeah, and so that first point I think is important. That doesn't really come up in, it shouldn't come up in magazines I, I, or, or, you know, journalism. I mean, you're going to have one person assigning you and they're going to be busy and they're going to try and give you as little information as possible. Um, so usually you're going to know who your main contact is, but if you don't ask, but you know, it happens with corporate projects where sometimes like this team of two or more people hire you and it's really helpful to try and get them to tell you that one person is going to be your main point person because otherwise you're going to be getting information from multiple people and you might be getting revisions from multiple people and multiple drafts of revisions from multiple people. So, you know, tell them, make it about them, say, you know, I can help you as a, more efficiently if, you know, we can just kind of narrow it down to one person that I work directly with, if they haven't already done that. And I think the second bullet is important too, and again, that doesn't, in journalism, I wouldn't ask for a template right away because you're the journalist, you should do the research, you know, but sometimes you get asked to do um, a story, a trend story for um, a newsstand magazine, and chances are they did the same one year the year before. Like you know, the state of small, the state of healthcare for small business owners. You know, they probably have done that in the last couple of years as healthcare gets more and more crazy. Um, so if that's what you're assigned, you know, you'll be poking around their site and seeing maybe how they've done it before. But if it's um, something you're just say you're assigned a different kind of profile for a magazine, and you just you, I don't know, you haven't really seen anything like it in the magazine before. You just want to make sure you hit it on the head. And this happened to me recently for a trade publication. They just said, could you write a profile about this person? And they had some specific requirements. And I said, well, I'd love to see an example if, you know, if you've done this before. And so they sent me one and that was helpful. But I think it's even more helpful in the, it comes up more in the corporate world. Um, and it's really helpful to see a sample if it's not something that you can easily access on their site. So I would certainly ask for that. And it might help the client know in the corporate world, it might help them clarify what they want if they have to go and think about, oh, well, we really liked the way our competitor made this marketing document, or we really liked this marketing document someone else at our company made three years ago, and here it is. Um, you know, a goal, the goal for the website document or article, I think that's you know, going to be obvious in journalism, I think that's going, that's more a question for a corporate client. And again, that's a question you can ask if you're getting the sense that the person you're talking to isn't really sure what they're going, you know, what they want, what they want to do with this document at the end of it being produced. And um, maybe a, a more specific twist on this question is who's the audience that's going to be reading this marketing document that um, you want me to create? And I mean, I, I'm telling you, half the time I ask that, the client says, that's a really good question. We're still grappling with that. And so then, and then that, that gets, <laughs> yeah, and so then that gets worked out. And I think that's really important to know. Who is the audience and what is your intention? You know, who, what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to put it? Is it going on the web? Is it, you know, going to journalists? Is it going to customers? Um, you know, talking about deadlines, that fourth bullet, I mean, obvious, I think that's obvious, but um, there's a lot of editors that won't necessarily, and going back to journalism now, um, sometimes they won't give you a lot of particulars in an email. They'll be like, great, that sounds great, write it. And you're sort of left saying, okay, well, 
when is it due and how long is it because they didn't really say and and um what's the word count and and um I know they said they pay a dollar a word but now they're telling me it should be around 700 to 1200 words and so how do I bill and so you need to clarify in an email um you know sometimes and that, and that last point on there um we've talked about this previously are there some ways to broach I mean I, I feel like the deadline handoff dates you can you, you can really broach that without it becoming awkward but yeah that's um, that last one can can sometimes be a little awkward because you're dealing especially if you might be dealing with a a large corporate client uh, they're thinking, I don't know, payroll panels. That, that's you know, is that really? Oh, my the how problem? long does how long do you take to pay? Yeah, how long do you take is to that, pay? Because that's important for a freelancer, obviously. Yeah, I would. I know. I know. People maybe think it's awkward because I think talking money is awkward with the people that you're mostly going to be talking words and concepts and you know messaging with. But it's an important part of your business. So um, if if you haven't agreed to a contract with them either because they've sent you one or if you've sent one and it's kind of a big blank, um, I just ask, you know, what is when do you, what is your standard payment? And um, if they usually know, if they don't know, they will, you know, they'll ask accounting and they'll find out. If it's a large corporation, I mean, they're probably going to enter you into their vendor system and you're going to get like a whole document that says how it works and you know, we pay on net 30 or whatever their terms are, but, um, you know, you know if, sorry, I, just, I was just looking at, looking over the bullets on this slide. Um, what jumps out at me is evergreen article, you know, <laughs> like, a, uh, I think like the obvious, uh, use case for these points is the evergreen article for the glossy that sits around for yeah. six months. And then they say, Hey, why don't you update that evergreen article? And then six months later you update it again. But, um, these are probably all good ways to, at least sort of head off some of that. Right, and with that evergreen article that sits around, um, in fact, I was talking to a couple of people about this this weekend who had sold essays to a women's magazine, and um, even though their women's magazine, their essay keeps getting pushed back and back, they got paid on acceptance, and you know, if at all possible, you should push very, very hard for that, because getting paid on publication can be a real bummer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Waiting, you know, six to nine months after you have the piece accepted. That's just, you know, what if the magazine folds? It's, I think that's too risky. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a good chance for me to pitch eByline. I'll throw that in there that uh, freelancers get paid on acceptance and they get paid within 10 days. So. Oh, fabulous. Uh, yeah, that makes their lives a little bit a little bit easier. Um, and actually the publications uh, find it pretty easy to, uh, to get the invoices done. All right, that's the end of uh, flogging the, the company there. We'll move on to the next slide, which is uh, dealing with curveballs. Um, many different interpretations of what a curveball is. I know we we have we've talked about this down there. It says publication politics, standing in everyone's good graces. Sometimes that's a problem for folks. Sometimes it's not. But um, the demand for revisions, which we were sort of just talking about with Evergreen article, seems to be uh, a, a very very common uh, complaint from freelancers. Um, how often would you say you've been asked for for a major rewrite? an article and, and is there a, a sort of a graceful way to handle these requests? Um, graceful way. <laughs> I don't feel like, I don't feel like it's, it's the norm. Um, and let me just backtrack. I feel like you, cause we haven't talked about this yet. Um, it's really helpful to talk to other freelancers you know, one-on-one -on, -one on email or on listservs or on a forum like eByline, um, what they know about writing for a certain editor at a certain publication or a certain section of a certain publication, you know, how are they to pay? How are the revisions? How's that editor to work with? Because some have reputations of, you know, sitting on their stories or asking for revision, revision, revision. Um, so it's good to know these things, and that's another way you can head off some of these frustrating experiences. Um, That's right. Day. You've mentioned in the past that getting intel from your freelance community is sort of huge. how you do your due diligence. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, I recently had a thing happen where I was, found myself working with an editor that I don't want to work with again, and I just assumed that it would be great because I was referred to her by another editor at the same publication, but they were like night and day. And then I found out from a mutual friend who had worked with this editor when the, the, the bad editor, when the bad editor was at a different publication that she had been a big headache for my friend. And, you know, if had I only thought to ask beforehand, I probably never would have even gone through that experience. And it was a big time-wasting experience. Um, but um, 
you know, sometimes you're asked to do revisions and the big ones and that you might find unreasonable. Um, but I mean, I was just kind of, I was just in a little a group of freelancers talking this weekend, listening to a woman who regularly writes for like the Atlantic and New York Times Magazine, and um, you know, in a situation like that, <laughs> they might you kind of do whatever they say because if you want your piece to appear, if that makes sense. And, you know, with this, maybe a smaller thing, you're working for a regional arts magazine, um, maybe they're giving, you know, you've asked, been asked to write a revision that you think is completely over the top once, maybe you choose to not work with them again. Um, I mean, I've had it, you can certainly make your case when someone says, you know, I really think you should focus more on this aspect here or I need you to go back and re-report this anecdote and if you absolutely don't agree I think you can diplomatically say well I think you know I've already covered that in the story or I don't think that's going to produce the result that you want but um, sometimes you just have to kind of do it but I haven't found this to come up very often I think because I try and weed out the bad editors in advance. Sort of um, an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yeah, um, but you know, it is sort of part of the territory and you kind of get to know how people work. I mean, I've, I've used to work for one publication and they would say, okay, be ready on Tuesday because we're going to be sending you our comments and it was a weekly trade magazine and you know, so throughout Tuesday as I was working on something else, they would just be emailing their questions like one at a time, like all day long, which is kind of like a crazy way to do it, but um, that's Doesn't the way they worked. And, <laughs> You know, I didn't work with them for very long because I found it annoying. But <laughs> 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 they were also a publication that would always try and assign me like a really big feature on a Thursday night that was due like Monday after a holiday weekend. And they just, I don't know, I guess they felt like I could get the work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and of course, every publication has sort of its its whole production cycle. And yeah, uh, when you work with them, you know that there are going to be, you know, if, if they do everything on Monday, then, you know, if you want to work with them, you're Monday. ready. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And what about what about um, sort of uncompensated demands for your time? Uh, the emails that ask for story ideas, clients who say, you know, what about this other angle that you mentioned the other day? Why don't you check that out for me? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you know, there may be another variation on that is you turn something in and then suddenly they want a sidebar. So ask for more money. You know, well, that's another. You know, that's me reporting 300 more words. So how about 300 more dollars? <laughs> Um, the, the, you know, it, I don't feel like it comes up that often for me. Um, maybe again, I'm just trying to be selective on who I work with, but, um, I have had editors in the past. I had one who, um, was always wanting to talk to me and hash out ideas for her section as if I was a contributing editor or contributing writer, only she wouldn't give me that credit she wouldn't pay me and so I just stopped answering her messages um, and I kind of trained her that you know like I'm busy I'm on deadline but you know would love to talk if you're actually assigning me something or if you want me to like pay me to do this work with you but sorry you know otherwise sorry and you know once in a while you might um, if you have like some area of expertise and this kind of came up for me for a little while where editors like during the recession editors wanted to pick my brain a lot about freelancing, ones that were worried about losing their jobs or were thinking of taking a buyout or, you know, just wanted to be prepared because they were seeing the writing on the wall. And um, I don't know, because they were my editors, if they were ones I, you know, was, um, you know, I valued the relationship and I liked them and I wanted to kind of do them a, a turn because they'd given me a lot of work. It was, some, sometimes I'd have like, you know, an hour conversation with them on the phone. It didn't happen too often, but I think, I think the thing to watch out for is just people asking you, when you're aware of the difference between a favor, you know, because you know it might come back to you one day, you know, you're doing something nice for them and they'll think it well of you and give you more work or when they go somewhere else, they'll hire you at their new publication um, versus feeling like you're being taken advantage of by being asked to do more work for not additional money, you know. And when you have that feeling, you need to either cut them off and not do the work or, you know, demand extra money. So it sounds like just sort of being firm but but clear that your time is valuable yeah. to you as a freelancer and, and then they understand that. And... Yeah, I mean, everyone, you know, everyone's going to try and get something for free. 
I'm, but um, a lot of times there is more money if there is more work that they need you to do. So, yeah, I think it's definitely worth asking. Oh, oh okay. iTunes. iTunes <laughs> popped up. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, we have on here pick your battles. What to do when you feel an editor has breached a commitment. Um, has that happened to you? And how do you handle that? I don't feel like an editor has breached a commitment so much as I've had a couple stories um, where I just, well, here's an example. Like all of a sudden I, I had an editor who, she was really clear. I'd get the assignments. I'd send her like a little confirmation that says, okay, here's how I'm going to approach this thousand word web story. I'm going to write about X, Y, and Z. Does that sound good? And she said yes. And I turned stuff in and, you know, it seemed like we had, were in a good groove. There were never like a ton of edits, just some questions and she might fix a few things. And then I turned something in and I was asked for like a top, you know, a bottom to top, top to bottom rewrite. And I was like, wow, did I really get this wrong or is something going on over there? And um, I was really busy at the time and had the flu and was like doing a full-time contract job. And I just, I did it, but I made sure I like confirmed with her what she wanted so it wasn't going to be extra work that would not be what she wanted again. And then afterwards I said, is something going on over in your newsroom in you know, did I did I really mess that story up because this is sort of a new one in our relationship? And and she said no. They had had um, they had like some not turnover. They had uh, changes in management. And there was like a new layer of management that came in above her, and they were asking people for um, more and more revisions. And she felt like she was being micromanaged, and her writers were being micromanaged. And then there were layoffs. And I don't know. I guess it's not really maybe that's not really. Um, answering your question so much is I feel like um, <laughs> it, it hasn't happened very much. Well, um, well I guess what, I do... what you're saying is it, it has, it, what doesn't happen is, is sort of outright uh, uh, editor fraud where, where somebody really reneges on a, a commitment to you. It sounds like what happens is publication politics gets in the way or the reality of a newsroom and a publication yeah. cycle gets in the way and somebody sort of put up their backs up against the wall and, and their yeah. boss says, well, you know, tell the freelancer just to do it over. There's usually a reason, but that's not just, I mean, you hear about freelancers, it's not the norm, but you know, stories get killed, sometimes it's the freelancer's fault, sometimes it was just like, there was a more, if it's, you know, in a faster news cycle publication, like online, sometimes, you know, just something more newsworthy happened, or sometimes it's just politics of the publication, and you do hear about that stuff all the time, and sometimes you hear about people not getting a good kill fee, but, um, I don't, you know, I don't think you should operate in in the mindset that that is like freelancing all the time. It's such these things do happen and they really stink when they happen. But hopefully, um, you know, if you have a good relationship with an editor and you've tried to vet the publication of the editor as best you can before you go into it, um, these things like will be the extreme rarities. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I haven't even really had, I haven't, I haven't had a story be killed. I mean, I've had some frustrating rewrites. I've never been stiffed for a payment either, and I know some people have, but I guess they're just maybe a combination of luck and um, preventative measures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And picking um, where I work. You know, I try and go where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, just like the bank robbers do. Uh, it makes sense. In terms of staying in everyone's good graces, is that... Uh, um, you mentioned maybe that's more of a corporate thing when you're dealing with the team and there might be some conflicting um, yeah. goals, conflicting targets. I know that. I don't feel like that happens a lot with um, publications because you're just get an editor is just going to give you like the bare minimum information you need to do the job because they're so busy and they don't have time to give you the whole drama. Um, sometimes you do get a sense that there's some drama going on and um but you're still going to have one main contact, so it's not really going to affect you. I mean, the best way to stay in their good graces is to do the good work and, you know, do everything the way they want it. Um, but with corporations, sure. Um, I've certainly had those internal battles. I, I've, I've walked off a few corporate jobs because they were that volatile. Um, and, and just in time too, you know, like only to hear that three weeks later, the whole other free, rest of the freelancing team got fired by this crazy corporate team. So um, 
I think that's another reason I guess trying to have one main contact is really important. I mean, sure you'll probably be working with two or three people in some situations, but you know, the one main contact is kind of like your buffer between all this behind the scenes stuff that you don't really need to know anything about if you're not on site at the company. But yeah, it, I don't think it, that's as much of an issue, the whole, you know, drama, because of the nature of not working in the office. Yeah, yeah, yeah I understand. Um, that brings us to our last, our last uh, pillar of maintaining an editor relationship is staying on radar, um, something that I, I've mentioned this to you, something I always yeah. found really tough, uh, especially if you are working with people who are far away. Mm -hmm. uh, who are busy, as editors always are in every newsroom, everywhere, and um, just trying to stay on, on their radar, trying to pitch them ideas, trying to get them to throw ideas at you and throw yeah. in more work. And um, my experience, and I'm curious to hear sort of uh, your tips, but also your experiences. My experience was um, that I had good relationships with editors. Editors have always said, uh, you know, we love your work. Um, we want to throw you more stuff. And then, you know, I didn't hear from them for a couple of months until I pitched them. So. Uh, yeah. We have a couple of bullet points on here, and, and uh, if you can walk us through them, I'd appreciate it. Okay. I mean, I think the most important thing, you know, some of these things are just sort of smaller things you can do to, like, stay on their radar. Like, you know, if you see a relevant link, even if you're not suggesting it as a story, or, you know, I thought you'd be interested in this thing the New York Times did on where our industry is going. Send it, you know, send them holiday cards retweet them, stuff like that, just to stay in their orbit. But the most important thing to getting assignments is pitching them. And, you know, what you described is, you know, them saying, yeah, I totally want to use you again. But their main thing is, their main um, daily and weekly and monthly MO is, you know, filling the section or the pages or the part of the publication or the whole publication that they are responsible for and making sure, you know, they have stories to go in those slots and then the stories that are coming in for those slots are good and edited well. And so they're probably not, you know, they're not devoting a lot of time to thinking, what should I assign Michelle this month? You know, it's more like, I need a story. Okay, we have this one story that's not assigned a writer and what writer are we going to send it to? And so sometimes it works out that an editor realizes, oh, you know, Peter's like kind of really great with mobile apps, and here we have one on mobile apps. So let's give it to him. Um, and so making time to pitch is kind of the most important thing. And it's the hardest thing. And I mean, it's a work in progress for me, too, because sometimes I get so busy and I don't have time to pitch. I mean, sometimes I have emails piled up from a few, cause just a couple of different editors I'm working with, but saying, please pitch me. And I'm thinking, God, when am I even going to do that? Like, I don't have time this work weekend. I don't have time this weekend. And, you know, sometimes I'll make the time late at night or something. But can I tell a quick story of meeting an editor this <laughs> past week? So and we don't always get, I know you, can, you can't always travel and go meet them, but if there's any way to do it, you know, tack on an editor meeting to a trip, it's so valuable. I just went to L.A. this weekend for a little, like, writing getaway with some other writers, um, but I made sure that I went a day early and rented a car and um, all to like spend an hour with this um, executive editor for a publication that I've been working with for a couple of years. And it was so worth it. I mean, we've been trying to meet for, I'm in Seattle and she's in LA and we haven't met, and but we've been try, we tried to meet last time I was in LA and it didn't work. And she, she had the flu and she's like, well, if you don't mind, just come to my house. I'm working from home. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I won't kiss you, and we'll just stay far away. And it was great because, I mean, within the first 10 minutes, she said, I have this one feature that I've been thinking about giving it to you. Would you be interested in it? And I'm like, sure. My trip is now paid for. And she's, you know, and she said, you know, and ask me all your questions about the publication. Tell me all of your concerns. And I asked her, you know, various things and got more sense of what they wanted beyond what we would talked about on the phone before. And she also said, you know, please pitch me more features. Why haven't you pitched me more? And I said, oh, it's just been a time thing. So it's so valuable. I mean, it just, you know, you're fresh in their mind. And, you know, I wrote to her today to confirm that assignment, and she wrote right back. And then I met another editor while I was there who I work with at a trade publication. And um, and it wasn't even so much to, to work for more, the trade publication more because they kind of cut the rates, and I'm not – I don't know if I'm as interested in working with them that much more, but um, she's just somebody that, you know, we've talked about our freelance 
travails over email too because she also freelances. And so I found out about a really interesting book project she's working on that I may be able to contribute to. And these things just don't come up over email. Um, so if you find that you have a couple editors in one city and you have like some excuse to go to that place, it's so worth it. Um, you often can leave with some good leads or assignments or just, you know, the, the goodwill of them, you know, letting you know how much they appreciate you. And it just, it just makes a relationship that much stronger. So I think it's really important. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. I had one one particular point to bring up about staying on radar, um, and and you did. I mean, you just touched on it, but um, getting FaceTime. Um, okay, you you went out of your way. Uh, um, many people freelance for local uh, editors, local yeah. corporate clients. Um, I don't know how do you, how do you go about doing that, and and sort of what's the right way to do it on a regular. And basis? that seems so easy to me. I mean, so if it's out of town, by the way, the way I would phrase it, because I know people are worried that, well, what do I do? I mean, just tell them you're going to be in, t tell them you're coming to their city. Do they have 15 minutes? You'd be happy to stop by their office or like the cafe they liked right by their office. They like right by their office. You know, make it easy for them. Don't be like, come meet me downtown an hour from where you work. Um, you know, offer to pay. They'll probably pay for you. But, you know, I don't know. I like to try and offer. Um, but I don't know. Sometimes there's this weird struggle over that. But I, I um, if it's local, it's even easier. I mean, just say, you know, we've, we haven't met. It would be really great to meet. I'd love to come to your office sometime and just, like, bring you a coffee. Is there, you know, is there a day of a week that would be good for me to stop by for 15 minutes? And, I mean, it's kind of like 9.9 .9 times out of 10, everyone's thrilled for this, as long as their schedule allows and as long as you make it easy for them. And if you're offering to come right to their desk or, you know, to the cafe, like, on the corner where their office is, there's almost no reason for them not to, unless they just don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, right, and, and at least then you'll know. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, okay. sometimes they're asking you to come meet them, so yeah, it's just, you know, just make sure you're doing it in a way, a time and a place and that's convenient to them and that you're conscientious of their time. Okay, that sounds like good advice. Um, I, there's a there's a couple points on here about uh, you you talked about retweeting and we we have a bullet point on here about being judicious using social media. I want to come back to that in a second because we have a great question about that. In fact, we have okay. more than 20 questions and we okay. don't have we only have about 10 minutes left, so okay, I do want to get to a couple that. of them. So um, let me just fast forward here. Um, so let me go back to that question that I just had. Uh, here's a question from one of our attendees. I just followed you on Twitter. I'm also following a number of editors at publications that I've pitched. Is it stalking to tweet to an editor you don't know? I don't think so. I've done it before. Um, I mean, what exactly are you tweeting to them? <laughs> I mean, I think a good, a good first approach is to kind of, you know, give them props, retweet them, show them that you're reading the publication and, or, you know, say, oh, now reading article on blah, blah, blah and Publication Act, really interesting. And, you know, so maybe kind of get on the radar a little bit that way. But um, if, I guess I've tweeted editors to kind of as a letter of introduction only when I couldn't get an email address. Um, but, you know, if you've already emailed them, I don't know how far I'd go in terms of trying to like get their attention in a conversation or a pitch on email. I mean, on Twitter. Sorry. Um, hey, you've mentioned to me not sucking up too much on the on the social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you want to keep it. Uh, your, the idea is to keep it professional and keep it. Uh, I mean, yeah, it is what it I is mean, in social it's media. It's like a so. balance of of knowing that you know every once in a while you appreciated a good feature that they did, but you know if you're retweeting them and singing the praises of them every single day, they might start to get a little worried, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's, here's, this is, this is probably the question that everybody asks, but that's hardest to answer. And I don't expect us to actually answer this right now, but I do want to get just maybe a uh, two sentence take from you on this. What's an appropriate sure. going rate in today's economy? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Okay, well, I mean, I don't think I even want to work for anything that pays less than a dollar a word, but that's you, you live in Seattle where that doesn't even get you a third of an espresso. 
I know. Well, a dollar a word, so you know you're not going to write a one-word article. <laughs> but I mean that. But that means that most, like, say your regional organization, your regional publication, like Seattle Magazine, they're not get, those regionals aren't going to pay a dollar a word. The alternative weeklies aren't going to pay a dollar a word. If you want to have an essay on Salon, or if you want to, you know, pu get in Modern Love in the New York Times, those things pay like a hundred bucks or three hundred bucks. So. It sort of depends what your motive is, but let's just say that your goal is to make as much money as possible, um, then try and get a mix of trade publications and like corporate work in there where you can make like one, two dollars word and up and you know, really pay for those, you know, say you love writing about the arts for your local arts publication and you know, you're willing to do a thousand word feature for four hundred dollars. Those, you know, more journeyman projects will pay for that. Mm -hmm. But the, the rate is so all over the map. But you know, there's some really bad rates out there. So it's, I don't know. I would, I would encourage people to shoot as high as possible. But sometimes, money doesn't coincide with the type of writing or publication you want to write for. So sometimes you have to balance that with um, gigs that pay better. If that makes sense. It does. It does, and, and, and I mean, rates are totally relative. It's relative to the publication, relative to how much time it's going to take you to do the assignment, relative to where that's you true. live. Um, also, relative to time, and that maybe that's one way to answer this question: is um, have you been able to maintain uh, what are pretty high rates? I mean, you're a, you're a very well-known writer. Uh, over the last few years, during the recession, coming out of the recession, have you have have those editor relationships that you've built over the years allowed you to continue to make the, the same kind of money? Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily even work with people that I worked with a few years ago. Last year, I had my best year I ever had financially, um, probably because I wasn't doing a book. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, I mean, I just think as you kind of go up and up. The publication ladder, um, you know, there are better rates to be had, and I know, you know, I've certainly seen it where publications they well they stop using freelancers or they slash their rates by like, you know, twenty to seventy five percent, and um, you know, obviously I stop working with them and I find someone new to work with, but I am a firm believer that like, um, you know, in flight magazines, alumni magazines corporate custom publications, association publications, there are thousands of these. And if you can get hooked up with them, which is sometimes easier said than done, you just, sometimes it just happens and falls in your lap or sometimes you kind of research it and find out how to do it. Um, those can, I mean, I know tons of freelancers where like those are supporting us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I yeah. have, uh, well, that was, that's, I have I have two questions here that are that are sort of they're sort of follow ups to that they're they're very, they're about getting uh, sort of signals back from editors. Um, here's okay. the first one is, in your opinion, what does it mean when your editor doesn't send you feedback and makes either small or large changes um, without letting the freelancer correct the changes? Is it just to save time, uh, possibly yes. because the editor doesn't think the freelancer can correct the changes him or herself? Um, it might be the second thing, but it's you know I can't say without you know knowing them and you and all that but I mean usually it's just this is how they operate and it's the fastest way I have some editors that do that um, you know and it depends how badly you want to see those changes I mean for some of the types of publications I just mentioned you know I'm fine with not seeing the changes also because I've worked with the editor before and I know they're not going to do anything terrible and but you know, you are perfectly entitled to say, uh, and if you, you feel very strongly, and many people do, and especially if it was, you know, an article in a really widely seen publication, to ask to see the final version before it's going to print or going online. Um, the good thing about online is if you know somebody makes a mistake, you can have them change it easily. But um, but you know, a lot of people will just send you the final. I have some where they send me the PDF to look over before. It goes, you know, into layout and then into the magazine. And maybe this person was asking. I mean, that's that's one side. I I, I read the question in a, in a slightly different way, which is, what if I want that feedback and want that chance to mm -hmm. sort of hone the writing, make it a little bit better? Um, can you follow up uh, after? I mean, you know, you don't have a 
necessarily a huge say uh, in many cases in newspapers, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, is it okay to follow up with an editor and say, hey, you know, I like what you did with that story, or I, I noticed that you changed the lead or you changed the kicker to it. Um, you know, I want to make my writing better. Could you, you know, maybe just give me some feedback on it? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. Um, just try and make a request as brief as possible and as easy as possible for them <laughs> to give you Respect the feedback. Respect their time. Respect their time. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, some editors are going to learn more from than others, and that's unfortunate, but it's true. Yeah. And it, well, here's and this other one is, is a similar topic. Um, I hear this story is not right, but please pitch me again. So I pitch again, and I get the same thing. Uh, are they just blowing me off, or do they really want me to keep pitching? No, I don't think they would. If they, I don't think they would say pitch again if they don't want to hear from you, unless you were introduced by somebody that they feel very beholden to, and they're just doing it for their friend. And you know, and that probably only happens like if you've taken a class with their friend, and they feel like, oh well, my friend referred this person, so I should really consider their pitch. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I would, I would keep pitching until you get it. I mean, I think. Why would they even say that? And they don't. A lot of times, they wouldn't even respond. So I think that take that as a good rejection. Okay. I certainly do. You know, I get excited if I get that kind of rejection. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know that's it's the, creepy, that's the good rejection. but do you change? Than, I'm curious when you've gotten those uh, rejections. Um, how quickly do you follow up? Do you, do you sort of take a take a pause and go back and read ten back issues and reassess your approach, or do you really just you throw another idea out there when you have it? When I have it, I mean, it it it's that so depends because, I mean, the last time it happened to me was, I mean, because I, I got because I have to say I'm not pitching I haven't been pitching new publications that much in the last few months because I've been tied up with other things. But in January I was shopping around an essay, and there were two places I really wanted to send it to, and um, one didn't answer until I like pestered her and then she said no sorry it's not right for us we ran something like it and then the other one said. Um, you know, I'm going to pass, but it's good to hear from you and pitch again. And I, you know, I have some ideas for them and I haven't been able to do them yet. But so I, you know, but if you can pitch again quickly, sure, that's even better. Um, but, you know, I'm a bad example of that because I've been too busy to pitch new places. I think we have time for one last one and it's got to be quick. Um, so the, the, I'll read this to you really quick. Is emailing or okay. calling a more efficient way to pitch, especially when you're trying to reach a large number of editors for an event coming up? I know you're going to say email, but I am really curious about uh, when you do have sort of uh, access to an event that's coming up, maybe it's because you're local or you, know, you have a ticket to a big consumer electronics show or something like that, and you do really want to uh, nail down as, as many assignments or at least an assignment, uh, and, and so you do want to reach out to a lot of people quickly. Uh, how do you do that? Okay, so I hate getting phone calls of pitches from publicists, and most editors are going to tell you and writers are going to tell you they hate getting phone calls. So I wouldn't call unless it's someone you've worked with before because most people really don't want to hear from you on the phone, I'm sorry to say, just because it's a real big interruption. And so say you're pitching an event and it's so time sensitive you need to get the assignment in the next two days, just pitch everyone by email at once and, you know, I know it would be embarrassing if you got an assignment from two places that were competitors, but everyone should have those problems. So, um, <laughs> you know, the first person to, to snap it up gets it. And, um, you know, if somebody, if you do hear from two newspapers or whatever at once, you know, just, I'm sorry, I already sold the idea um, to a competitor. <laughs> or, I don't know, leave out the competitor part. But also follow up. You know, send it the first day. And if it's time, so time sensitive, you need the assignment in a couple days, then follow up the next day. Better and, you know, ask forgiveness follow, than permission is what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, and follow up and say, hey, if I don't hear from you um, today, I'm going to assume you don't want it and pitch elsewhere. And if they want it, then they'll really move on it. And yeah, that's all, right. all you can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, we've run out of time. I want to thank Michelle uh, for sharing her experiences with us. I want to thank uh, everyone who attended the webinar today for joining us. Uh, for those of the guests who aren't members of eByline, uh, we encourage you to apply for membership on our website, ebyline.com. Um, we currently have about 1,700 members. We right now are only accepting uh, you know, professional freelance journalists. We do get a lot of student journalists as well. I hope that we can include them 
uh, at some time in the future. But if you are a professional freelance writer, professional freelance journalist, please go to our website and uh, put in an application. We are adding publications pretty much every week. And uh, as I mentioned, we have recorded this webinar and we will be uploading it to our website so you can watch it again or share it. Uh, thanks so much, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Thank you, too. It was fun. Thanks for all the questions. Oh, and I forgot to mention to our members, we are, uh, we are indeed uh, doing a drawing to give away uh, several signed copies of Michelle's book, My So-Called Freelance Life, which is hilarious and fun and will make you think of all the, all the good and bad stuff that's happened to you as a freelancer. So uh, <laughs> those emails will be going out soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.